Hi everyone and welcome to today's In Conversation series where we're joined by Dr Richard Kidd. So my name is Dr Fiona Rossidi, I'm a GP and I'm on AMA Queensland Council and have been a GP in the local area for about six or seven years. Um, we're very lucky to have Dr Richard Kidd with us today. He has 33 years in general practice and aged care experience under his belt. He's also a past president of AMA Queensland and is the chair of the Federal AMA Council of General Practice, as well as being a lecturer in the, in the Master of Medicine Aged Care and a local GP, previous practice owner, and has lots of experience. Thank so you. thanks for joining us. Thanks, Fiona. So today we're going to follow on from last week's conversation about the Aged Care Royal Commission and the recommendations made. And I guess the AMA perspective on that and the general practice perspective as well. So I guess, Richard, you've been involved with the AMA response to the aged care inquiry. Yep. Um, tell us what your general opinion is on some of the recommendations and the outcomes, I guess, that have now been accepted. So the um, Commission's 148 recommendations, many of them are very good. Uh, but not all of them. And the devil, as always, is in the detail. So overall, there are some things that are really good around the governance for aged care. Um, so setting up a, you know, a new maybe uh, a national authority, um, giving it a lot more teeth, um, that, that's important. One of the really important things that has come out of this is something that the AMA has been advocating for for years, and that is to increase the number of nurses in the aged care facilities. Um, and I'll speak some more about that a bit later on, if I may. But um, again, you know, that's a very good recommendation. Um, some of the recommendations around general practice are not so good. Um, in particular, I think it's recommendation 56, part G, part five, um, is um, predicated on general practitioner or general practices becoming accredited for aged care and then having no say in who their patients are. They have to accept anyone who chooses to become their, their patient, whether they've already got overloaded books or whether it's a, a family with someone who um, is abusive and might threaten physical violence, um, that general practice will have no option to say no. So the, we really need to look at the detail very carefully and that thing in particular is something that we really need to fight strongly against. It's just going to drive a lot of current GPs out of aged care. So not all the recommendations are good, but many of the ones around um, nutrition, around um, social engagement, around getting more allied health into aged care are good. Sadly, the re recommendations are quite silent about the barriers to GPs going into aged care. Um, and I don't think, you know, they can really force general practice to do it through yet another accreditation. Um, we absolutely have to fight that. Being accredited as a general practice is the gold standard in Australia. Uh, it's general practice accreditation, I think, is in many ways at a better standard than even some hospital accreditation. So we don't need lots of more little itsy bitsy accreditation processes. Um, being an accredited general practice is it, and we do everything from lust to dust. And I guess that's probably the argument from a lot of GPs. It's hard enough to do aged care currently. Yes. If the government creates more barriers to getting access to, to aged care for GPs, it's surely going to make it harder rather than easier for patients to access a GP. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, the things that the this commission could have also made recommendations about are things that we've known for a long time that used to be there when we had the uh, the Aged Care General Practice Panels Initiative in the early 90s, or oh, it might have even been the late early 90s. Um, a lot of things came out of that that were very sensible. And um, for a while, we had a little renaissance where a lot of aged care facilities were um, putting in a dedicated examination clinical room for the visiting doctors where you could examine a patient in private, where you could have sensitive conversations with a patient around mental health issues or um, some family distress. Um, that's gone. 
um, we used to have um, a lot of enthusiasm in the aged care industry to um, make it a, a lot more welcoming. We, we used to have uh, a registered general nurse that would um, go around with us who knew all the patients, who knew what the problems were, what was emerging. And in those days, you know, if you went once a week or maybe once a fortnight, you often anticipated problems before they became really significant. Um, so I think, you know, one of the other issues around the preventable hospital admissions from aged care is a direct result of having had such a, a massive erosion in the registered general nurse part of the um, aged care workforce. And if we can get back to the sorts of levels of very experienced, dedicated registered general nurses in aged care that we had in the 1980s and the early 1990s, a lot of the other problems that this commission has been addressing will go away. It comes down to clinical governance. And if you've got enough really ex good experienced general nurses on the floor, they will see things like malnutrition problems, poor quality of food. Um, they will see things like people not getting enough social um, uh, interaction. So uh, it's a really important thing to set right. It's something we had and we lost it. We've got to get it back. And I guess that's one of the key recommendations of the commission is to, one, increase registered nurse time. And as we were just discussing, there's an extended kind of target for that over a couple of years. But I guess the other concern is funding. So who's going to fund the extra registered nurse time? Yes. And also, where are we going to find these registered nurses? I wonder if you have an opinion perspective on that and, and why yeah. perhaps the three to four year target to get to those those care ratios is that funding or yep. to train people what are your thoughts on that well I might start by um, if we put up that little infographic um, this is looking at the period from 2003 to 2016 and um, already by 2003 I was one of many voices saying that the um, the number of nurses in aged care had diminished to a point where it was already in crisis. But we can see from 2003 to 2016 that the percentage of registered nurses in the aged care workforce dropped again from some 22% to 14%. So there was another third of the nursing workforce that, that disappeared in that period. And they weren't the only ones that disappeared. The Allied Health also went from, uh, I think it was about 12% down to about 4%. And um, when we look at what the commission is saying now, we can see from this infographic that this was um, a railway crash that was bound to happen. And um, we now, coming to your question, and I think we can, uh, people have seen enough of the infographic, um, coming to your question, it's curious that the Commission has put very, very tight timelines on a lot of other things that you might think are very, very hard to do in, in less than six months. And yet the, the real core problem with um, all of these issues is not having enough nurses, and that's been put on a three or four or five year timeline. It's not good enough. The AMA federally has had a campaign going in association with the Australian Nursing and Midwifery um, oh, ANWF. Can't believe I've forgotten what the F stands Federation, for. Maybe? Federation. That would be it. Federation. Yes, we're a federated country. Um, so we've had this mm. care can't wait campaign going for a, a while now, and you know if there was sufficient will. The, a lot of nurses would probably come back into aged care, mm -hmm. but it's about remuneration, it's about conditions. The, 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 the situation at the moment is that newly graduated nurses are going into aged care and just it's a burn and churn. They are working ridiculous hours, they're under incredible stress um, because there's just not enough of them to do the work. And it breaks their hearts because most of them really care about the patients, the residents, and yet they can't get to the residents. They are tied up in act fee and other paperwork, and the paperwork has exploded immensely. Um, but it's meant that the clinical care has just gone out the window for them. So for them, it's not what they signed up for. They wanted to care for patients, and that's not what they're getting to do. 
Um, I think that if we made the remuneration a lot more attractive, if we made the conditions a lot more attractive, and if basically the nurses could would feel that they were respected and valued, um, a lot would come back into the aged care industry very, very quickly. So it's about setting those levers right, and that could be done tomorrow. Mm. You know, the, the, the government, if it chose to, could invest a lot more mm. in aged care, mm. and it needs to, and particularly in general practice, nurses, and allied health. Mm. They are the people that will keep people well and keep people out of hospital. And the AMA federally with their health economist has identified that there's some $21.2 billion in potential savings by preventing the preventable hospital admissions from aged care facilities. And to prevent those preventable hospital admissions, it means having enough GPs, enough nurses and enough allied health all doing the work that they've been trained to do. So the, the solution is there and that the government could invest very heavily in nurses, doctors and allied health and make massive savings almost overnight in terms mm. of preventable hospital admissions. Mm. So it's, a, it's just how you look at things. And I guess that's my experience of age experience of aged care and probably yours as well I imagine is that um, currently the environment tends to be more putting out spot fires and potential preventative medicine which is what we should be doing yep. um, and I think a lot of that comes down to lack of time and remuneration for GPs so often there isn't the time to spend doing preventative care or you have so many patients you just have to deal with the emergency at the time or they're not recognized perhaps through lack yep. of experienced nurses till the last minute and so I mean I'd be curious to think to see what your opinion is on GP remuneration for aged care and you know whether that needs to be considered as well as the RN time and, and how we might do that yeah. like whether federal AMA federal has any suggestions or has put forward ideas about that yep so GPs like me and you have for many years now um, been doing aged care more as a charity than as part of our remuneration because we're not well remunerated. Every time a, a GP goes out of their general practice, particularly private billing GPs like me, and goes to an aged care facility, we lose money, a lot of money. You know, as a private billing GP in my practice, when I go to an aged care facility for the same amount of time spent with patients, I would be getting a third or a quarter of what I would be getting in my um, clinic. And that's to say nothing of the time spent going there, the time spent trying to find a car park, which is now really challenging, the time spent trying to find a nurse, which is really challenging. Um, reading through screeds of notes, um, a lot of which has been copy and paste, as you would have noticed, um, and doesn't really add much meaning to what's really happening with the patient. It's just white noise. And it makes it really hard when a GP visits to work out what's been happening with this patient over the last week or two. Mm. So we've got all of those challenges. It makes mm. for a lot of wasted time, a poor remuneration, um, a lot of frustration. And then if you're a GP like I was in aged care where I was working 24 seven and I was getting calls at two o'clock in the morning that mm. uh, Mr. Jones was sitting on his chair and slipped off his chair no injuries, but I need to let you know, doctor, because that's the policy now. Mm. Oh, and he banged his head, so we're sending him to hospital unless you come and look at him right now. Um, so I would mm. sometimes go, and most of the time, I would go and look at that poor person to save them the really unpleasant experience of having to go to hospital at two or three o'clock in the morning, sit on a um, trolley in an emergency department with a significant risk of falling off the trolley and breaking their hip. And when, to begin with, nothing was wrong, but it was a kind of lawyer driven policy in the aged care facility that if the doctor didn't get there and, and mm. say the patient was all right, the patient had to go to hospital. Mm. Um, so there have been a number of things that have changed mm. and made it really um, challenging, frustrating mm. and mm. difficult, mm. much more so than it needs to be. Mm. It used to be so much easier. And the, the GPs, I think, as well as the nurses don't feel respected or valued mm. in this work anymore. And when there's nothing else going in your favour, you know, at least feeling a little bit valued is something, but there's not even that anymore. And I guess the, um, 
as you said, with the AMA Federal and the Health Economist, I think proving that a lot of these hospital presentations are preventable is where you get your health funding to then put back into general practice yep. and, and registered nurses, isn't it? If the saving come 21.2 billion dollars, a lot of yep. money that you can invest in training to avoid Absolutely. that. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the, the, the government can and needs to find um, funding to make these things work better. Mm -hmm. And the, the um, Royal Commission's recommendations are pretty much saying that mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the things around the governance and, you know, the, 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 um, the Commission didn't mince their words when they criticised um, um, governments over successive um, administrations for being um, fairly poor leaders mm. and for the poor governance and the poor leadership at the highest levels and that flowing through. So, you know, we need to get that part of it right. Mm. We need to have substantial investment in aged care and in the health um, in terms of doctors going into aged care. And we also need to look at how to get geriatricians and mm. maybe physicians and maybe even surgeons visiting mm. aged care facilities mm. Um, mm. for that preventive health um, aspect. Mm. Um, you know, I can think of a number of patients who ended up with um, terrible contractures and you could see where it was going. Mm. But to get that patient seen by someone when um, they maybe had a bit of dementia, um, uh, they had no way of, of mm. getting into a maxi taxi and going to a, a surgeon's rooms or, or for that matter, a geriatrician's rooms. Um, so th there are a few geriatricians who visit, but very few. Mm. And we need to change these things. And it's going to cost money, um, but it's also about changing things like having a place where a doctor can sit down with a patient in private, where a doctor can sit uh, or at least uh, examine the patient in mm. private. Mm. Um, so th there's a lot to do, but we did it before. And that mm. was in the early 90s. And, and that was exciting. Mm. And then it just all slipped away. And I guess that touches on one of the other recommendations about the use of telehealth in, in aged care. And I, AMA has been very vocal in a positive way about telehealth, particularly through the COVID-19 pandemic. And I guess it does change sometimes the use of telehealth in aged mm. care since the original kind of conversation about telehealth and access to specialists and GP rebates for telehealth yeah. in aged care. So what are your thoughts on the recommendations about the use of telehealth? Well, now? the recommendations are, are good, but they're naive. Mm. And what I mean by that is that um, in the current situation, um, telehealth has to be effectively face-to-face -face or voice-to-voice. -voice. And at the moment, the Department of Health and really the Treasury Department is not wanting to open it up to a doctor talking to a nurse about a patient. Mm. And we can spend half an hour talking with a nurse about a patient um, who has um, become very unwell and we're asking what the clinical signs are, what's been happening. And the patient themselves is very often at this point delirious. Um, and yet that does not qualify mm. as a telehealth uh, rebatable item number because it's not effectively a face-to-face -face or voice-to-voice -voice consultation with the patient. So there is, um, I think, a fairly cynical um, um, obstruction by the Department of Health and Treasury to uh, what would be good quality care. Mm. Um, at the moment, GPs who do aged care continue to take these calls in the middle of a busy day when you're in the middle of another consultation, as Ian said last time, that can put the, the consultation that you're in in the room at some risk because you lose your train of thought. Um, and also, uh, you know, GPs like me have those conversations at two o'clock in the morning. And then sometimes after talking for three quarters of an hour on the phone, you get up and you go and see the patient, um, but you'll never get back that three quarters of an hour in the middle of the night mm. um, or the sleep or anything else. And there's absolutely no remuneration for that. Mm. And there won't be for the mm. foreseeable future unless the Department of Health um, introduces some new descriptors around telehealth that recognise that when a nurse in an aged care facility is talking on behalf of the patient, 
that should be a rebateable mm. um, service. Mm. Um, but we, we've got a way to go before that's going to happen. And it's a shame because telehealth mm. in, in many ways has been um, a, a really fantastic uh, adjunct to our face-to-face -face mm. care for our patients. Mm. And it's something that when aged care, we've been doing for generations without mm. payment. Yes. And I think that's one of the positive things, if any, to come from the COVID-19 pandemic is the use of telehealth in general practice is quite widespread now and hopefully yep. will become the norm. And I guess we need that extension into aged care, given our work practices are different, when yep. nursing homes are locked down, you know, we, we need ways to access patient care and, and protect patients from, you know, potential deterioration. And, and unless that's remunerated, you're gonna get less and less people doing that kind of work. Yep. Yeah. And it's a solution that's right there, you know, theoretically mm. the, the department could start making that kind of, um, a uh, new item number mm. tomorrow if mm. they chose to. Mm. So, yes. So it's good to see AMA Federal continuing to advocate for that. On and so behalf. we shall. Yeah. It's really important. Mm. And at the end of the day, it's all about the patient. Mm. It's all about trying to do the best thing we can for the patient. Yes. And general practice at the end of the day is the most efficient, cost-effective part mm. of the whole health sector. Mm. And we're also the cheapest part. And it's about time that the government started doing some substantial investment in general practice to further enable us and enhance our abilities to do what we're doing really well already. Mm. But you know, if we were enabled through proper resourcing and remuneration, um, we could do so much more uh, in terms of those preventable hospital mm. admissions mm. in aged care, mm. um, little, the people in their homes who are aged. Um, People over the age of 65 um, represent 46% of all of the preventable hospital admissions. Mm. Um, and that $21.2 billion that we're talking about, that's really just aged mm. care. Mm. Mm. So um, mm. the, the, if the government chose to, there could be substantial savings. And at the end of the day, much better outcomes for mm. our old people. So I guess, were there any other recommendations or from the Royal Commission, from an AMO perspective or federal perspective that you think are important or um, have been overlooked, I guess, or not funded properly that you think we should continue to have in the conversation? Well, as I said earlier, I think one of the really important things here is that the, the Commission has recognised that it's important that there be access to general practitioners for, for residents in aged care facilities. And it is a challenge. And it's certainly a challenge for any of the other specialists. Um, but it hasn't really looked at how to enable that. Mm. And we've already done that in the 1990s. And the Department of Health would still have records of the GP panels initiative and the learnings from that. And, you know, if there was goodwill about this, we could very quickly get a number of things back on track that we had in place. Um, as I touched on before, a clinical room. Um, dedicated car park for the, the doctors when they're visiting. Um, when we get the registered general nursing workforce back up to scratch, um, the, the nurse being able to go around with the doctor instead of us trying to find the patient. And mm. the number of times the patient isn't in their room, but you don't know where they are. Mm. Um, you know, the, the, there's a lot of things that could be um, fixed very quickly mm. with mm. a bit of goodwill. Mm. Um, the, the other thing that I don't think the, the commission really touched on, except um, saying that they needed uh, uh, a new system, a new authority to um, enforce standards. Um, there is a, a bit of a wicked problem in aged care, and that is that um, at the end of the day, most of the aged care is now done in big corporations, and those corporations are owned by shareholders. And so these big companies, their, their first responsibility is to um, their shareholders. And we need to be realistic about that. I think the Financial Review did an article, it'd be about three or four years ago now, at that time saying that aged care was still the best blue chip investment in Australia. Um, well, that might have been so, but as the Commission has highlighted, and as we know, um, the shareholders might have been doing well, but at the cost of the residents and their health. So we need to look at how we can make that dynamic work better. 
by all means, people should be able to make, you know, a reasonable living and I guess a bit of a return. Um, but there, there has to be a high standard of care, a high standard of nutrition, a high standard of social support. Mm. And um, that's possible. We've had it before. Mm. Can I touch on what you mentioned earlier about, you know, really it's the over 65s that this encompasses and um, some of the recommendations about home care packages and um, eligibility and waiting times yep. and how GPs can be involved in that. What, yes. what are your thoughts on those recommendations? Well, again, that's been a wicked area. Um, 30th of June this year, there are 102,000, more than 102,000 Australians waiting for their home care package that they had been awarded, that they had been, you know, approved as being eligible, mm. and they're on a waiting list. Mm. And for the level four packages, that waiting list is three years, uh, 34 months and upwards. And the level one packages is seven months. And so the commission quite rightly said the federal government's got to get rid of those waiting lists. Mm. It's really got to mm. make a lot more packages available. Um, uh, the number of patients I've seen over the years who were waiting for packages that might have kept them at home mm. and they ended up in a nursing home because they'd never got the package and they could not maintain their health, their nutrition um, without that package. Mm. Um, and it never came. So that absolutely has mm. to be fixed. Um, so I, I think that's a, a, another very important part mm. of it. And I think the commission got it right that that Mm. That's a high priority. And the government's done something, but I yes. don't think enough. So do you think then the recommendation that um, eligibility for the assessments might be one of the roadblocks to getting a package? Well, and there is that as well. And how can GPs help? Or do you think that, I mean, is it people who have been assessed and they're waiting for the funding for their package? I mean, can GPs help improve yes. access to packages, do you think? Yes. Above and beyond what they do? Yep. Mm. Um, so most of those packages now happen through the My Age Care um, gateway. Yes. And um, that has been a bit of a rocky road. Um, we used to have a very clear cut age care assessment team that would seek the information from the GP. And that information is gold. You know, we mm. know our patients, we know mm. what their, their issues are. And yet in the current system, very often, we are never asked for any information. Mm. Um, and that's a, a serious deficiency in the current system. Um, and the aged care assessment teams now often don't have a geriatrician on the, the mm. team, which mm. is another serious deficiency. Mm. So absolutely, we need to get back to that. And I don't think the commission recognised that enough, that they suggested a system where if there was some complexity, the uh, there should be an aged care assessment team that mm. steps in and, and does the assessment. But I think really everyone should have um, access to a, a proper aged care assessment team with a geriatrician, a nurse, and they should get the information from the GP. And now that we've got the My Health record, it gets somewhat easier because the shared health summary at least is there. But you know, talking to a GP on the phone, mm. they, they can get so much information. Mm. And there'll be information there that might not necessarily be on a My Health record. Um, some people uh, feel very um, uh, private and mm. don't like some stuff being put up there. And I, I can remember one patient who used to um, berate a friend of mine who every time she did a referral to a specialist would have in there that, you know, he'd had a stroke some years earlier. And every time he saw it there, he would come in and, and berate her and say, I never had a stroke. Well, he did, but he didn't want to admit he'd had a stroke. Um, so sometimes the shared health summaries, which are negotiated, might not have really important information on there. Um, mm. So a chat with the GP is really mm. important. Mm. Um, we can also um, initiate those referrals. Um, but again, the process is, is fraught. And when we do initiate or we do get involved with the My Age Care Gateway, we don't get any feedback mm. about how that person is progressing in mm. the assessment process. Mm. Mm. So the AMA has been advocating for a long time and I, I was sitting on, I think I still am on the My Age Care Gateway Advisory Group. And we have been pleading that there be an automatic process for keeping 
the usual GP in the loop. Um, so again, mm. a lot more work to be done mm. in that space. And I think that exactly touches on the nature of um, aging patients as we see it. They're much more complex and yes. there's many more care needs that are required. And so that involves their transition into aged care via yep. their home care packages. Um, people are living longer. They have more complex medical conditions. They're That's surviving right. things they previously haven't. Yep. And um, their comorbidities are significant. So yes. what's required for a home package and then into aged care is getting much more complex. And yep. I think the commission recognised that to a degree. Um, do, you, do you think they've got enough in their provisions to kind of that that's the reality or i think so but again some of the things that they acknowledge they didn't then follow through with the recommendations very well mm. and one of that was that with the home care packages i think it was in the commission stuff you know you read so much stuff everywhere but about only two percent of the um, funds in the home care packages actually went to um, allied health services right and yet for most of those people who are having a bit of trouble maintaining their home and their garden and think, you know, they need to get um, people in to mow the lawns and, and certainly do the roof and things like that, the, the, the people don't recognise that if they spent more on the allied health, mm. they might be able to do a lot of this stuff again themselves. Mm. So, you know, when we talk about enablement and empowerment, we need to make sure that the system actually um, enables that mm. so there needs to be a way that the usual gp can again advocate that that money goes at, at least a, a proper amount of it goes to what's really needed which is uh, quite often allied health mm. Um, mm. and maybe um, uh, a nutritionist um, mm. to help the people understand that you know they need a lot more protein as they get older mm. rather than a lot less which is what often mm. happens and certainly that's my experience of aged care. If people had access to more and more frequent, more often allied health, and yep. um, I guess that's a preventative strategy yes. from then secondary falls prevention, hospital um, presentations, but also improving quality of life, yep. you know, like they're more mobile, they're able to interact more socially. And so the flow and effect is significant from something as simple as yep. extra allied health input. Yep. Yeah. And that's where the Department of Health could learn from the Department of Veterans Affairs. Mm. The Department of Veterans Affairs has now got um, cycles of care where the GP does a very simple referral to um, a physiotherapist and maybe a psychologist and maybe an occupational therapist. And for each of those allied health, they have the opportunity to give 12 treatments to that person in that year. And if they do the 12 in the first two months and there is um, a clinical need another 12 can be done and another 12 mm. but it means that the GP is at the, the the center as the GP should be and is um, supervising or overseeing the, um, the, the the taxpayer dollars at the end of the day mm. and that they are being spent appropriately mm. but the DVA system means that the people who need a lot more to support them or enable them to, to be able to be independent, they get it. Mm. But we're limited with the GP management plans to five that we have mm. to spread across a bunch mm. of different allied mm. health services. Mm. So if we can get enrolment, patient enrolment, working properly, that might be a way that we can simplify mm. access to more allied health, particularly mm. for people over the age of 65, mm. Uh, the very frail mm. um, people recovering from strokes, you name mm. it. But at the moment, you know, the five and 12 months is, is just doesn't go anywhere. Mm. So, I, you know, from our perspective, it's disappointing that it's taken the Royal Commission, I guess, to get us to this point. But it is positive that it's shone the spotlight on aged care and the challenges. As you said, yep. the 1990s was perhaps the last time it was kind of revamped and, and kind of looked at. So... I guess we're in a position now where we have the opportunity to kind of um, drive the conversation in a way that hopefully is productive for everyone. Okay. I guess, um, I think we're nearly out of time, but perhaps, you know, can I just get your yep. closing thoughts on what the AMA's direction is kind of as the commission has the recommendations and accepted and where we should 
their efforts, I guess. Well, broad strokes, the, the um, Commission's approach that there needs to be an authority and that that will drive reform, that's really important. And the AMA is very supportive of that. We, we need reform. We need something that is big enough and strong enough to help drive the government in the right direction with this. We absolutely need a lot more investment and we have to be careful of the devil in the detail mm -hmm. that some of the stuff about general practice is just going to create more barriers and i can see that the the commission was well intentioned and we're all talking about primary health care reform um, and you know the patient-centered medical home absolutely is the way to go and aged care sitting in a, a general practice that is accredited across the board um, that is a patient-centered medical home is the way of the future. Mm. Great. Thank you so much for coming on today to the In Conversation series. Your insight is invaluable, I think, and your perspective Thanks. from, you know, your experience in AMA Federal is, is amazing to hear. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks.